I want to start out by saying that everything I am about to discuss is alleged. All the sources of information about the preceding individuals mentioned will be linked in the description below. Do not come for me, Ryan. I am a broke bee and don't have any money for a lawsuit. I am solely doing this video for entertainment purposes and my own curiosity. The following information is not backed up by my first-hand account and is only stuff I found while researching articles on the subject. I also have many opinions throughout this, and they are just my opinion. You can't sue someone for having an opinion. So get the frickety frack out of here if you're offended by my opinion. In college, I actually was a, a film student at UCSB for quite a while and um, thought I was going to direct um, you know, for about a year and a half. And two years, I, I explored that, uh, made a bunch of short films. Really? Well, no, wait, where can we see these short films? Nowhere. <laughs> I've made sure of that. <laughs> you will buy YouTube to prevent them. I will literally buy YouTube to prevent them from coming out. <laughs> I will literally buy YouTube to prevent them from coming out. <laughs> Ryan Kavanaugh was born in Los Angeles, California, to his parents Jack and Leslie Kavanaugh. Leslie is a real estate broker, and his father Jack was a dentist, and later became a businessman, and is now the CEO of Nanotech Energy. Nanotech is basically another renewable energy research and development company. Their vision statement on their website mentions a battery designed to be more sustainable, renewable, and faster than a traditional lithium battery. So Ryan's dad seems like a smart and well-respected person in the business world other than the fact that he had to pay damages for selling a fake Picasso painting. This video isn't about his dad, though. So, why did Ryan end up the way he did? Money. The basic answer to that question is just lots of money. Essentially, just another story of a trust fund baby. Ryan's first business endeavor began with a venture capital firm, which is a company that provides private equity typically to small businesses and startup companies. The easiest way for me to describe it would be a firm that invests in other companies to share a portion of that company's equity, which basically means that the venture capital firm would own part of the business's shares. Usually a startup or emerging company would seek investment from a venture capital firm so they have enough money to make the business they're trying to pursue feasible. Then the venture capital firm would make profit if the business they invested in ended up doing well. What I recall from my business classes is that Venture capital firms are usually not the most ideal way to seek investments. It usually ends up just being the investors taking advantage of the small business. Sometimes it can work out in the business's favor, but it's definitely not the most ideal way to gain capital for a startup company. In his 20s, Ryan was able to have top investors at his firm that included higher-ups at Warner Brothers, Columbia, TriStar, and well-known producers of the film industry. Ryan's venture capital firm ended up failing, which was likely due to the dot-com burst and the plummeting of stocks after 9-11. After this crash, Ryan's investors started asking for their money back. Allegedly, Ryan became hard to get a hold of. Some of his former clients supposedly ended up suing him after he apparently sold many of his stocks and lost the majority of his finances. One client named John Cheney, who was the chairman at one of the companies Ryan's firm was supposed to invest in, alleged that Ryan never paid him the millions of dollars Kavanaugh's firm was supposed to invest in. This would later be included in a lawsuit that one of the former investors would file against Ryan. They settled the suit out of court, and one of the lawyers told Ryan's parents that, you're lucky your son isn't walking around in striped pajamas. Ryan ended up moving back in with his parents after the failure of his firm, and later started up Relativity Media with the help of some of his former movie industry clients. Relativity disputes many of these allegations made against Ryan, but of course they do. While editing, I found that Ryan even went as far as suing John Cheney for defamation after he accused Ryan of not investing the millions of dollars he said he would into his company. In 2004, Ryan founded Relativity Media, which was fairly successful at the beginning and was even the third largest mini-major at one point, according to sources. If you're wondering what the frick that is, according to Wikipedia, a mini-major is a larger film production company that is smaller than major studios and attempts to compete directly with them. But even with the success it once had, Relativity and Media ended up filing bankruptcy in 2015. 
The company survived for over 10 years before filing its first bankruptcy, but it really only survived for that long due to shady business practices. So let's dive into what exactly those shady business practices were. When Ryan founded Relativity Media, he created an algorithm to predict if a film would be successful. Ryan claimed that his algorithm had an 85% accuracy, but according to a source that was close to one of the company's lenders, it was actually much lower than that. An 85% accuracy for predicting if a film is going to do well is very high. It's so hard to judge how the public is going to consume a product in general, let alone predicting how profitable a subjective piece of art is going to be received. About two years after the initial startup of his new company, Ryan was arrested for drunk driving and even had a hit and run incident while under the influence where he allegedly sideswiped a police car. He was only charged with a DUI though, which was lessened to a wet and reckless charge. Wet and reckless usually equates to the charges of reckless driving, which therefore lessens the consequences that you would otherwise face if you were charged with a DUI. Two more years pass and Ryan is yet again arrested for speeding and driving under the influence of alcohol. Man, does this feller not learn his lesson. He was also under probation for his first charge during this time. He ended up taking a plea deal and resorted to using a driver after his second arrest. But of course, he denies this. After the first bankruptcy filing in 2015, Relativity Media was sued by one of its lenders, RKA Film Financing, claiming that Ryan misused the millions of dollars they had invested into Relativity Media. RKA was calling Ryan Kavanaugh a con man, and Relativity Media countersued for $200 million. The suit was dismissed under the basis that RKA did not provide significant proof of their claims. In 2018, Relativity Media filed for bankruptcy yet again, which prompted a hedge fund investor named Kerry Metz to file an amended lawsuit accusing Ryan Kavanaugh of defrauding him into investing in Relativity Media. Metz claimed that Ryan conned him into making a $10 million investment in 2013 and another investment of $2.5 million in 2015 when Relativity Media was on the verge of its first bankruptcy. In the amended suit, Metz alleged that Ryan lied to him in order to get Metz to invest the initial $10 million. Essentially, Metz was claiming that Ryan Kavanaugh lied about the success of his algorithm that would predict how well a film would do. The amended suit ruled in Ryan's favor yet again on the basis that it was improper and without merit, meaning there was no finding of exploitation. I do want to mention here that there are many cases that are thrown out on the basis of not having evidence. There's a huge possibility that Ryan did verbally lie about the algorithm being more accurate than it truly was, but that is something that would be extremely hard to prove in a court case. There's also a big chance that Metz knew what he was getting into and knew that Relativity Media was a risky investment, but pursued it anyway only later to find out that it did not pay off. I'd be pissed too if that much money was lost in an investment. The case ruled in Kavanaugh's favor though, so everything Metz said is still alleged and there is no basis to validate his claims against Ryan. During the same year, another man named Adam Fields filed a lawsuit against Ryan. This lawsuit was filed against Relativity Media and Ryan Kavanaugh, alleging that Ryan had forged a memo accusing Adam Fields of sexual harassment. Fields alleged that he was wrongfully terminated because of this. The judge ruled in Fields' favor after finding evidence that the memo was falsified by a person known as Cav Cav. It was also very weird how none of these sexual harassment claims were used as a reason for Adam Fields' termination. During the investigation, Fields hired a forensics expert who found that the sexual harassment memo was altered in the metadata by a user named CapCap, two weeks prior to Fields being fired. The court documents also accused Relativity and Media executives of conspiring to sabotage Fields. They were essentially trying to find any possible reason to fire him to make room for someone else they had brought on. The court ruled in Fields' favor and he was awarded roughly $8.5 million in damages. In my opinion, this is one of the worst accusations I have seen regarding Ryan. I would even go as far to say that $8.5 million in damages is not enough for falsely accusing someone of being a sexual predator. This hits home for me because I have dealt with much of my own sexual trauma, 
and false accusations like this hinders the justice system even more than it already is for survivors. Reading about this is triggering for me and really just pisses me off. The justice system is already so corrupt for people who have gone through things like this, and I personally feel like Ryan has contributed to that corruption after reading about it. In 2019, Ryan was hit with another lawsuit from the former CEO of Entertainment Stock X, who was also his ex-business partner in another company Ryan founded known as Proxima Media. Elon Spar claimed Ryan had misled him into believing Proxima Media had capital. He also alleged Ryan was running a Ponzi scheme at Proxima by using new investments to satisfy old debts. Ryan denies this and they settled out of court. Elon Spar later withdrew his claims after the settlement. They both claim the suit was submitted by mistake and that the media spun it into something it was not. Ryan later claims that it was a draft complaint that was never filed, but even though it was never filed, it was still submitted, but never reached the court. Ryan uses calculated words to make it sound like this was never a thing, but the only reason Variety and other media outlets were even able to get a hold of the story is because court documents are publicly available due to the First Amendment under the umbrella of freedom of the press. Elon Spar would claim that it was submitted by mistake, but to me, this really just sounds like two rich guys coming to some sort of settlement out of court so Ryan could cover his scummy vagina yet again. No facts for this, just my opinion. This happens all the freaking time though, so that's why this is my best guess. It was during this same year that Ryan and another business partner at Proxima Media, not Elon Spar, acquired majority stake in Triller, which is a video sharing platform that is very similar to TikTok but way less used. Kavanaugh and several other stakeholders at Triller were named in a recent lawsuit against the company. This new lawsuit is over the use of a patented triangle-shaped boxing ring that Triller allegedly stole and marketed as their own. There is no settlement or court hearing in place that we know of now. I have a feeling that Triller is likely going to lose this one since the triangle boxing ring is already patented. That is just my opinion though, I'm trying to cover my ass here. Before this latest lawsuit, Ryan was also involved in another lawsuit that was filed in January 2021. This time, Ryan's former babysitter was claiming that Ryan fired her after only two months into her 13-month contract. She sued for $175,000 in owed wages. The case is still pending according to court documents. So that means they have not settled and haven't reached a ruling. I also want to mention that while editing, I found another article from 2013 that alleged Ryan was being investigated by the LAPD for interfering in a manhunt. Ryan supposedly landed a helicopter at an LAPD center during the search for Chris Dorner, who was a former police officer that committed a series of shootings in several Southern California cities. Kavanaugh was cleared in the investigation, and they found that Kavanaugh was given permission to land there. I thought this was worth mentioning because it was recently added to his Wikipedia page. I don't know why the police thought he may have been purposely interfering in the manhunt, or why he needed to land at the LAPD center in the first place. I know sometimes helicopters need to land in an emergency, but I couldn't find why he needed to land there at that time. After hearing all of that, it's safe to say that this man has been involved in many lawsuits and legal troubles over the years, according to many well-known and fairly respected news sources. This brings us to the ongoing legal battle he has with Ethan Klein. If anyone watches this video, it's likely going to be fans of the H3 podcast, so I'm only going to brief over the situation between Ethan and Ryan. If you want a more in-depth summary of the now three lawsuits, I recommend watching the many podcasts Ethan has discussed the ongoing situation or Emily D. Baker's videos and streams where she analyzes the court documents. So back in April, Triller filed a lawsuit against many websites alleging that they pirated the stream of the fight between Jake Paul and Ben Askren. The H3 podcast was included as one of the defendants. This suit was later amended and H3 was dropped as one of the defendants. 
Troller didn't stop there, though. They then went and filed another lawsuit in May alleging copyright infringement, and the H3 podcast was now the only defendant listed on this new lawsuit. Ethan tried to settle the suit out of court, but Ryan pushed for around $100,000 to settle, plus a ridiculous and disingenuous statement that Ethan would have to make on his podcast. Ethan declined his demands, and the suit escalated. In July, Triller amended the lawsuit and listed Teddy Fresh as another defendant. Triller was claiming that Teddy Fresh is not separate from the podcast, even though there is no evidence of that. Teddy Fresh has its own incorporation, its own employees, its own office space, and had no part in the comments made about the Jake Paul versus Ben Askren fight. To me, this just sounds like Triller is hoping to get any money they can out of the Kleins. He probably needs it after the two bankruptcies he's had in the past. Most of his latest business ventures don't look like they're panning out too well either. And for all we know, the man is about to file another one before this lawsuit is even resolved. That's a joke. I don't know that for sure. The latest and most intimidating lawsuit that has been filed against Ethan slash the H3 podcast is a defamation suit that was filed in November. The only reason this suit is concerning is the fact that Ryan got a very expensive lawyer, Thomas Clare, who specializes in reputational suits and has won several times. Ryan claims a lot of blatant speculation in this new lawsuit. He came out with a very long and, in my opinion, not very well-written statement on CSQ, a magazine that focuses on businesses and entrepreneurship. Ryan has also been a contributor to this magazine since 2020, according to their website. So it makes sense why they were so down with him publishing his own extremely biased and misleading article. In the article, he lists several reasons as to why he's suing Ethan Klein for defamation. He starts out by saying that Triller is the one that sued Ethan in the first place. He basically made it sound like he has no part in the initial suit of the H3 podcast, and Triller made that decision due to Ethan apparently pirating and republishing the Jake Paul versus Ben Askren fight to millions of people in his audience. He goes as far to say that Ethan caused millions of dollars in lost revenue for Triller because of this. Even though Ethan only streamed a few moments of the several hour stream while also making critical commentary about it. This falls under fair use, but Ryan is still trying to paint the picture that Ethan essentially stole from Triller and completely ripped the entire fight, but still he has no part in the initial lawsuit, so he claims. The main reason Kavanaugh says he's suing Ethan is because of Ethan's supposed misrepresentation of the article written and published by Variety that claims Ryan's ex-business partner accused him of running a Ponzi scheme. Ryan claims that Ethan keeps bringing up this old story even though the article was updated to show that Ryan and Elon resolved their dispute and the documents were submitted by accident. What I don't understand about this is that Ethan has said on many occasions that the article was updated something Ryan seems to look past. So, okay guys, this is an important disclaimer regarding the Ponzi scheme thing. So everybody listen up. We want to be fair, we want to tell the whole picture, and we want to be objective as possible. So when it comes to the Ponzi scheme, his partner, ex-partner who accused him of running a Ponzi scheme in Variety, actually took back the statement. What? But here's the details, okay? Okay. So the allegations that his former partner, who claims he was running a Ponzi scheme, were made under oath. Okay. Okay. Sounds serious. But... The ex-partner's claims, not under oath, once they settled, he took it back and he said he didn't even mean to file the lawsuit. So once they settled, mm -hmm. he, not under oath, said, oh, it was just a joke, lol, I didn't even mean to file the lawsuit. Under oath, his ex-partner said, this guy's running a Ponzi scheme. Got it. So just to be clear, it's rewind time. when he was speaking in a courtroom under the threat of perjury. Well, I don't know if he was in court, but I think he signed something under oath okay. verifying that what he wrote in the lawsuit was true and correct. Right. And and that the punishment for, for perjuring yourself it's, under it's, oath is very serious. Yes, yes, yes. So he would probably take that seriously. Whereas any statement that you make while not under oath, um, you can say anything. You, you can really say anything. A you want. big and so, lie. And so after they settled, right, his ex-partner, not under oath, said, um, he didn't run a Ponzi scheme and I didn't even mean to file the lawsuit, which by the way was a huge complaint. They spent a lot of money on. And so I don't really know of any lawyer that accidentally files a complaint. And by the way, the ex-partner used a real- Oops, it turned in the wrong paper. Oh my oops, god. Oops. Oh my god, I accidentally wrote up this huge complaint oh. and accidentally filed. How'd that happen? Oh. And apparently his, apparently his, his ex-partner, who accused him of running a Ponzi schemes, had a really prestigious law firm. 
It and they, sounds they like said, a thing that they would, a kind of mistake that they would certainly uh, make. It was just accidentally turning in like a hundred page complaint. Oh yeah, lots of time, lots of research, lots of effort. You know, they accidentally wrote it apparently too. <laughs> so I guess you all need to decide for yourself which version you think is true: the one under perjury, under risk of perjury, under oath, right? Or the claim after they settled of "lol, we didn't mean to file it." Just kidding. Hmm. So that's my disclaimer. Okay. Okay. Are we clear? Yeah, that was clear. All right. To me, this feels like Ryan went to great lengths to get this suit handled out of court to avoid public scrutiny. Now that it's being brought back into the public eye and questioned as to how court documents accusing such crimes could be submitted by mistake, he's probably pissed as hell. Oh no, the thing I tried to cover up over three years ago is now being talked about again. How dare people speculate how shady this looks. I spent all that money to shut everyone up and it still didn't work. That's what I assume Ryan's inner dialogue sounds like, but for all I know, he's just an innocent sweet gent who has never used his money to get out of a legal situation and definitely didn't have a drunk driving incident. This is another thing that he claims never happened in the article he wrote for CSQ. He says he never had a DUI, which is actually true, but this is another instance where he uses choice words. He was allegedly involved in a drunk driving and hit and run incident, but my speculation is that his daddy was able to get his DUI charges dropped, so Ryan didn't get that on his record. He does have a wet and reckless charge though, and fails to mention that. He then goes on to accuse Ethan of sending his fans to harass and send Ryan horrible messages via social media. This is something that Ethan has actually condemned, another thing Ryan loves to look past. Many high school students in trouble because of your podcast they blindly follow. Some you got expelled from school from you encouraging them to send hostile messages. Okay, first of all, this is just straight defamation. I have never encouraged anyone to send hostile messages. And anyone that does send hostile messages is fucking super wrong. And I think that you're a piece of shit, okay? I'll just say that. If you're sending hostile messages to Ryan, if you're sending death threats to Ryan, you know, fuck you. I mean, Ryan, what do you want me to do? You cannot say I'm encouraging people to send you threatening messages, you fuck. I mean, you're tagged. Ryan even goes as far as accusing Ethan of paying Wikipedia editors to slander his page, something that has no basis or proof to back it up. In fact, all of Ryan's Wikipedia page is full of sources such as Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, Vulture, and others. None of them have any association with Ethan whatsoever. If Ryan really has an issue with any of these articles that are full of the many accusations that have been brought against Ryan, he needs to take it up with them. All of the defamation he is accusing Ethan of falls back on fair use. Ethan is reading and commenting on these articles and public court records. We live in America, and you're allowed to have an opinion about someone here, you're allowed to be critical of others here, you're allowed to speculate here, you're allowed to read court documents here, and you're allowed to not like someone here. I think the biggest and most obvious thing I have learned about Ryan throughout all my research is that the man has an extremely fragile ego. Every public record of him that looks bad on his reputation, he has either denied or tried to cover it up as best he possibly can. There's so much information about his shady and slimy business practices out there though, and it was only a matter of time before people were going to figure him out. People already were figuring him out, it's just more public now because he chose to fight an outspoken social media personality. It's scary to think how many scummy people in Hollywood get away with shit like this for years, and Ryan is certainly not the only person who has. There's a lot of slimy stuff that goes on at the top of every industry, and this is only a glance at some of it. I really freaking hope all these lawsuits are ruled in H3's favor because if they're not, fair use on YouTube could become even more restricted than it already is. We already know that there are companies that are dedicated to flagging videos that have a few second clip or a few seconds of a song in them, even if the video falls under critical commentary or parody. Having freedom to express and criticize on YouTube is one of its greatest qualities. People are able to voice their opinion on here with a limited filter, which makes a platform such a versatile way for people to consume content. Personally, I get a lot of my news from YouTube because I can find multiple different perspectives on a story. 
I certainly have my criticisms of the platform that I will save for another time, but I tend to lean toward the good outweighing the bad that comes with it. At the end of the day, YouTube is a large corporate Google entity, and they're going to do whatever they feel is going to be financially beneficial. If Ryan wins a lawsuit against one of their biggest creators in regards to defamation and fair use, this is likely going to mean big changes to the platform, and they're definitely not going to be the changes that YouTube should actually be focusing on. It will mainly result in less transparency, and also won't be as entertaining. It will likely also result in more corporate control and become a lot less authentic than it is right now. I started watching YouTube when I was probably 12 or 13, and back then there was pretty much no restrictions, and the authenticity that came from that was so refreshing to see compared to what was on TV. While I agree that there needed to be some major changes to the platform over the years in regards to certain things like child safety, disclosing of sponsorships, etc. It doesn't need to become more limited with fair use than it already is. All I can really hope for is that the independent creator prevails and the trust fund babies govern themselves accordingly next time they want to throw daddy's money at another dick swinging lawsuit. <laughs> the seagull's bigger than the crow. They're both looking for the same thing. Look at this. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> He's standing his ground, the seagull. Look at this. <laughs> it's funny to watch. I'm in Centennial Park on Salt Spring Island. Look at that. Look at this, look at this, yeah! <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, the crow's very brilliant. <laughs> look at this, he's taunting him. Oh, yeah, this is funny though. I've never seen this before. <laughs> What's he up to? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the seagull's a lot bigger than the crow. But the, the seagull's very pissed off about something. <laughs> That's funny. The, I think the crow's decent, look at this. 